So hello everyone and uh, welcome again to uh, one of uh, other session on uh, uh, the stochastic modeling uh, thematic program that we're organi organizing here at AUB, uh, co-organizing co actually between the Center of Advanced Mathematical Science and the Alayan School of Business. Uh, today we're starting on the last theme, as I mentioned in, uh, in my email. Um, I'm Victor Araman, by the way, I'm an associate professor here at OSB. And uh, in that fourth theme, we're tackling uh, revenue management for platforms. The structure of that fourth theme is slightly different than uh, the previous ones, whereby we're gonna have a short course made of four sessions, two sessions given uh, by Florian Choken from INSEAD, and another two by Philippe Affech from uh, University of Toronto. And then we're gonna conclude the theme and the entire program with a seminar uh, a fifth seminar uh, given by Gabriel Weintraub um, that will conclude the, the whole thing. All right, so be, uh, basically before leaving the floor to Florin, I'm gonna introduce him. You know, again, I repeat myself every time we start a, a theme, you know, when I connected with all these guys, they, you know, I was so impressed to see how they quickly, you know, accepted to, to join uh, that effort. And, uh, you know, I think it, <clears throat> it showed uh, a very, um, I mean, it ended up being a quite successful one and hopefully we'll have other versions in the future of this, learning from this and try to see how we can, you know, uh, have a, 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 even a better format for, for, the, for next year. Uh, but Florian really jumped on, the, on that opportunity and, uh, and as same with Philip. Um, and uh, basically you, they, we work together to kind of make sure that revenue, you know, the platform kind of part of revenue measurement is covered Still, there is a lot of topics that could be fit in that. There's, we're gonna be focusing on, on two. Um, today uh, with Florian is gonna be you know, on online advertisement. Uh, so Florian is an assistant professor of technology and operations management at INSEAD. His research interests are in application of revenue management to non-traditional domains like online advertising, but also on other internet facilitated marketplaces. He's also interested in cloud-based optimization methods for massively sized data sets. Florian has been involved in building revenue management system for several technology companies in the US. He holds a BA degree in applied mathematics from Harvard and a PhD in operations management from MIT. So uh, without delaying this more, uh, the floor is yours, uh, Florian. Um, I let you introduce the, you know, the session today and also how you wanna manage the questions and, and all that. Thanks again. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, and thank you, Victor, for a very generous introduction. Uh, I mean, uh, honestly, I'm very humbled to be part of this lineup of, uh, of speakers. And um, uh, it was actually really interesting for me to think about how to put this, uh, this mini course together. And uh, I hope that it will be useful to everyone to kind of see uh, what's interesting, what's, what's the boundary of revenue management and platforms. And uh, again, I'm very humbled to be part of this. So, so this is sort of, think about this as my two cents of what I think might be some, some interesting problems to talk about here. Um, for, the, for the seminar, feel free to interrupt me at any point in time. I think it's, it's better if there's any questions, comments, just, just stop me and, and, and ask away. I think uh, it'll be better, it will be a better discussion if we, if we do it that way. So, Having uh, said this, um, why are we why are we talking about uh, platforms and marketplaces with revenue management? I mean, this is not really any kind of surprise. There's nothing shocking um, on this slide here. Um, if one is a revenue management or stochastics researcher, um, you can go out into the real world and you see lots and lots of platforms in uh, all kinds of different uh, contexts and all kinds of different industries. And what I have here are you know, sort of the ones that we all know about, but there's probably 99% others that uh, maybe fewer of us know about and, and that are interesting by themselves. Um, and I think that studying these, these kind of platforms has given our community um, a way to uh, use a lot of the technologies that we have to, to have an impact for, for, these, uh, for these types of uh, businesses. And it's also given us some new opportunities for new questions to ask um, in, in revenue management. So what makes a platform? 
And uh, what is so enticing about uh, these kinds of platforms that I was showing you before? Uh, well, at a very informal level, uh, platforms are successful because they aggregate and they can match supply and demand. And the other reason why they're uh, very valuable, and really that's where the value comes in from, is the fact that, um, well, they can actually do this at a much larger scale, uh, much larger granularity that maybe we would have seen before. So if you're thinking about, I will be talking more about online advertising and, uh, and Philippe will be, will be talking about the uh, ride hailing side of things. Um, well, if we talk about online advertising, uh, you're, you're matching web users impressions, you're matching them to advertisers. Um, well, advertisers will go to Google because Google will give them a scale like they've never seen before. Basically anyone who will go through the search engine um, will become will be a potential web user that you can you can reach as an advertiser. So, so that's the massive scale. Um, and then the other piece of it will be the granularity because Google will not offer you only the possibility to go to all of these to, to access all of these different users of, of the search engine. Uh, but it will also allow you to target them very, very precisely. So um, you go through the platform because you can match, you can reach exactly the type of user uh, that, uh, that uh, you want, okay? But by and large, um, some kind of aggregation um, engine between uh, supply and demand, uh, very large scale, uh, very, very, very specific granularity that uh, customers can reach via these platforms. And the broader question, I would say, um, if, you, if you think about doing research in, in this topic, um, well, the broader question would be, well, how to design the operations of a platform um, in such a way that you can achieve um, a certain objective. If you wanna look at a more specific question, perhaps, um, well, how could you actually match supply and demand? How could you match uh, web users to advertisers in a Google setting? Um, in such a way that you can maximize the revenues of a platform, okay? Uh, sort of a matching problem that would be, uh, certainly, certainly feels like kind of bread and butter uh, revenue management problem. So that's what's appealing about platforms. Uh, the other thing that's interesting to, to me as a researcher about platforms is that uh, you know, there's, there's, there's some old things that, that, um, uh, that uh, are interesting about platforms, but there's lots of new things that are interested, interesting about platforms um, when it comes to RM. So uh, you guys have seen from the previous courses a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of RM problems. I would say that actually when you take things to, to research in platforms, there's a couple of new things and a couple of new challenges uh, that you have to face and that you, you have to build upon uh, for, for revenue management. So challenge number one, is that, uh, like I said, uh, platforms are about scale and they're about granularity. So what's the consequence of this? Um, arguably the stochastic systems that you need to analyze with a platform, uh, they'll be of much larger scale than uh, the scale of traditional RM applications. Uh, so maybe much larger scale than uh, airline revenue management, for instance. And this also means from the perspective of stochastic, these kinds of systems might be more unpredictable. So more scale, uh, more unpredictability that you're going to have to deal with. Um, the other piece of the puzzle, uh, I would say, is that these, uh, these marketplaces are highly dynamic. So um, on one side you have demand, on one side you have supply. Um, the customers that make up this demand and supply might actually behave in extremely dynamic uh, ways. And uh, they might be extremely strategic in the way that they, uh, that they uh, uh, react to what the platform does. So again, to make an analogy in online advertising, well, a lot of online advertising marketplaces run via auctions. So you run an auction, how are your advertisers going to bid in the auction? What are gonna be the equilibria? Um, you're essentially creating an, an, an endogenous system with many, many different agents. Um, and there's gonna be a question of, of how do you account for the endogeneity um, in that system? <laughs> and that's why from a research perspective, I think something that's, uh, that's new about revenue management and platforms 
um, is that it sort of crosses two different fields. So a lot of the research that we'll see uh, today and on uh, in the next uh, mini course, uh, in the next module, uh, a lot of the research will sort of bridge the gap between uh, the control literature, the stochastic literature, online algorithms literature, um, and we'll bridge the gap with the market design literature, game theory, uh, to try to understand sort of the interplay between these different challenges. So on one side, uh, scale and unpredictability. On the other side, uh, basically the uh, strategic behavior of the marketplace participants. <laughs> so that's that's broadly what's what I would say is new uh, with with platforms. Um, now. What's the plan for today? And what's the plan for the rest of the course? So like I said, uh, and as, as Victor also, also mentioned, so it's not just me who will be running this course. Uh, basically the way that we decided to run things, uh, so it's, it's me and, uh, uh, and uh, Professor Philippe Afesh. Um, so I've done some work on online advertising um, and I will be running my side of the mini course on online advertising. Uh, he's done a lot of work in ride hailing, so he'll be talking about uh, that side of platforms. And I would say that they're quite different, uh, different research topics. Each one of them will have their own flavors. Each one of them will have separate uh, sub problems that will be that will be interesting and, and separate. Um, what I'm going to do in the online advertising side of things uh, in these two sessions, well, in the first session today, what I want us to look at is broadly speaking. Uh, something that you might have taken out from the previous uh, from the previous courses in uh, in the seminar is that in revenue management there's sort of a workhorse technique that's been extremely robust and we've seen it applicable to lots and lots of problems, uh, which has been fluid models and fluid approximations. So what I want us to do today is just think broadly about. Uh, in all sorts of uh, situations that uh, will be will be modeling how online advertising works, I want us to think about how we can use this fluid technology um, to actually analyze the systems and to solve the problems. Um, and then in the second session, actually, I want us to sort of do away with all these fluid models and think just broadly for all these stochastic problems. Are there some other ways of, um, of modeling them? Is there some other way of modeling uncertainty uh, that does not go through uh, this fluid approach? And I want us to think about alternative models of uncertainty um, and the respective algorithmic approaches that, uh, that we have there, okay? So <laughs> for today and for my side of things, uh, basically online advertising, uh, today will be about control using uh, a technique that you've seen before. Um, the next session will be about control um, with sort of something that's different from, from, uh, from these fluid models. Um, if there's any questions, again, you know, feel free to stop. Anything that, uh, anything that comes up, just, just, just let me know. Okay. So then having said this, um, what are the, what's kind of online advertising about? And um, how can we sort of build our way into some specific problems that I'd like us to understand today? Um, well, maybe the first thing about online advertising is that online advertising is a lot of different things. So even now, when you actually see an online ad, it could actually come from a, sort, uh, from, from a number of different systems. Um, there's sponsored search, for instance. Sponsored search basically means um, the, uh, that's a system that's built around sponsored search engines. So you get users who search for something on uh, you know, the Google uh, search system. And uh, these users are actually display, displayed ads um, on the site, kind of integrated with their search results. So that's one type of online advertising market. Uh, another type of online advertising market is something that uh, is, is called display ads. Um, and it's different because it's a different medium um, on which advertisers actually reach uh, web users. So in display ads, maybe a web user goes to uh, the landing page of the New York Times. And within the landing page of the New York Times, within a certain article, 
uh, there's basically a little ad that's embedded in there. Um, and that's actually served by a display advertising system rather than a sponsor system. And there's many, many other types of systems. You know, you could get ads in videos, you can get ads in apps. So many, many different systems to think about. Um, <clears throat> what I think is common across all of these is that all these systems are sort of built and draw value and offer value by personalizing the matching between the user um, or the impression, that's another term for, for a user who gets an ad, um, to the advertiser, to the, to the advertiser. Okay, so in other words, uh, the entire value of this is targeted, being able to match these people uh, extremely, extremely precise. <laughs> so what does this mean? Um, this means that basically a, a, a broad way to think about how online advertising works um, is that um, a user will carry some kind of cookie information with them. And every time they interact with an online advertising system, that cookie information is going to basically give some kind of feature vector about the user. So demographic information, what kind of things they shop for, do they have something in a specific cart somewhere, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and basically this uh, feature vector will actually allow the system to personalize the ad uh, by actually finding an, an advertiser that draws value from that specific uh, type of feature vector, okay? Now, what's the implication of this? Um, so like I said, basically the entire value of an online advertising system is the dimension of this feature vector. So you have lots of features. That means you know a lot about the users. Uh, you can target more precisely. You extract more information. Um, so that's the value of the system. I think from a stochastics perspective, uh, the challenge with that is that the larger this feature vector is, that means you have more and more and more user types. Uh, the scale grows. And also the more um, precise these types are, the more difficult it actually becomes to do the matching um, and to sort of predict um, how many users are gonna arrive, uh, sort of do all the forward planning that you might need to do uh, to, run, to run the system, okay? So <laughs> high dimension is sort of the curse, but it's also the blessing of, uh, of uh, online advertising. Okay, so for today, just to speak of a specific system, uh, but you know, really you could extrapolate this to other types of systems. I want us to focus on ad display, so on uh, ad display type systems. And for ad display type systems, uh, there's actually two different uh, mechanisms for running the system. So one mechanism is actually contracts based. And what contracts based means is that uh, the platform that runs the system will actually enter a contract with all the advertisers in the system. And this contract is basically gonna specify the entire ad campaign that's gonna run. So <laughs> that means that um, the targeting is gonna be pre-specified. So this particular advertiser, what are the sort of feature vectors that they actually want? What are the feature vectors that they don't want? Um, the prices are gonna be pre-specified. So if I deliver a user with a certain feature, this is what I'm gonna get. It's already decided. It's basically a constant. Um, and then the delivery capacities will also be pre-specified. So I'm gonna run a campaign. I don't want more than, I, I'm, I'm willing to pay for up to 10,000 deliveries of uh, whatever users I actually uh, deemed targetable for me. And then the question will be uh, essentially match. So it's gonna be about a, a question of matching. Um, in computer science, by the way, this might be called um, um, online packing, if, if that's a term that you're more familiar with. Um, and the question will be basically, how do I assign each one of the arriving users? How do I assign them to advertisers? Uh, so that I actually fulfill the campaigns at the maximum revenue that, that I can extract. And the question that I want us to solve is simply, well, what's the optimal matching, how can we actually compute an optimal matching for this type of problem? Now, that's one type of system. The other system that I want us to move afterwards um, is a system that's more typical of ad exchanges. So contracts are one way that um, ads are delivered in these systems. 
What's interesting and I think different from a lot of the previous applications of revenue management that you might have seen um, is that <coughs> a lot of these systems are actually uh, run via auctions. So instead of setting up contracts, uh, pre-specifying prices, kind of pre-specifying all of these parameters, um, what a lot of these systems do is they just let advertisers bid for the users as these users arrive. And there is these real-time auctions that actually happen where if I go to the landing page of the New York Times, well, basically in the couple of you know, nanoseconds that the page actually, uh, actually um, loads, what happens is that there's a system in the background that sends my, my, my feature vector. It sends it through an ad exchange and a number of advertisers will actually bid for this particular, for my feature vector. One of the advertisers is gonna win, then I'm actually gonna see their ad uh, being displayed on the page that I was just trying to load. So in the context of that, um, the advertisers bid. So there's, there's now a question of, of how to optimally bid um, in, in this kind of system. Uh, the platform will choose an auction mechanism so uh, it could be a second price auction. Actually, more recently, it's, it's more of a first price auction. And the question that I want us to solve there is, what is the advertiser's optimal strategy? Okay, so these are the two questions that I want us to actually think about um, in as formal terms as possible today. Okay, so first question, maybe think about it as uh, sort of a classical, more classical resource allocation problem with stochastics. Um, the other question, still a resource allocation problem. We'll see that it still has the features of, of an online packing problem. Uh, but, but now we actually have to think about an endogenous system, multiple agents, uh, embed a little bit of uh, game theory into things. <coughs> a common theme for actually both of these questions is that, well, these questions are hard to begin with. So sort of solving them to any degree of optimality might be hopeless. Um, and that's why for both of these problems, we'll need to have some kind of simplifying angle um, that will actually give us some tractability and allow us to make some headway. Fluid methods will turn out to be a great angle that will simplify both of these problems. And perhaps in this context, you know, what's the scale that we're talking about with online advertising? We're really, really talking about, you know, like billions of impressions that get uh, transacted each day, maybe thousands, hundreds of thousands of advertisers that are in the system each day. So really we'll kind of have the scale that makes fluid models uh, uh, work. Uh, fluid models are models that, uh, where the guarantees are asymptotic. So good if we have very, very large markets. Uh, but it'll actually turn out that fluid models by themselves will be sufficient for the first question. For the second question, we'll actually need something else as well, okay? So for the second question, we'll also need to augment the, the fluid way of thinking uh, with a simplified way of actually um, handling large-scale game theoretic equilibria. So um, by the second question, we'll already need to add something uh, new to this fluid technology. <laughs> Any questions? So then um, let's actually start asking, uh, answering this, uh, this first question and, and, and building, building it. So I said I was talking about um, a, a, an ad system where the ad delivery is actually done through contracts. Now, what does this actually mean? It's something called the ad display problem. So all of these problems kind of have a canonical name. So if you want to look up the literature, and by the way, I'll make a literature review um, available to you after, after this class. Um, ad display problem is sort of the, the, the keyword to Google there. Um, and you probably get some ads on ad display if, if you did that. Um, I, I, I'm actually going to try it out after I finish this. Um, but what actually happens in this problem? So let's say that this is a problem that has a continuous timeline from zero to cap T. And uh, we have an underlying bipartite graph. 
that sort of describes the, the web users, the advertisers, and the matching between these web users and advertisers. Okay, so um, let's index the users with i, let's index the advertisers with j. Now, <laughs> what I said is that there's already a contract. So at time, uh, you know, minus one, there is a contract that actually specified a bunch of uh, parameters of the problem. So each one of these advertisers will actually have a capacity CJ uh, for how many of these users, how many ad deliveries uh, they're actually willing to pay for over the course of their campaign. If an ad, if a user of type I is actually delivered to an advertiser of type J, there's gonna be a price, which to the platform is a reward um, that's actually paid out if the delivery happens, okay? And up to CJ deliveries. And these prices will express some kind of preference about this targeting vector, this feature vector that I was talking about before. So you can imagine some, some advertisers will ask for certain types of users. Um, maybe, you know, this particular user um, can only target, is only compatible with this advertiser and this second advertiser here, and so on and so forth. So there's some kind of heterogeneity uh, in the bipartite structure of uh, this, uh, this graph, okay? And the objective will be, well, over time, all of these users are gonna start flowing in um, and the platform will do matching. So it matches this guy with this guy, it matches this guy with this guy, it matches this guy with this guy, so on and so forth. And at the end of the day at cap T, what you wanna do is you wanna count this match, you wanna count this match, you wanna count this match at their respective prices. And you wanna have picked the matching that actually maximized the revenues of the platform, okay? In other words, maybe in computer science terms, you just wanna uh, maximize the weights of all the edges that you actually selected in uh, this graph, okay? The difficult thing being that the graph is actually, so one side of the graph is actually arriving online, okay? Because one user arrives here, then another user arrives here, another user arrives here. Uh, and there's also a flow because these user are, users are types. So, you know, there's multiple users that are arriving of each type. <coughs> okay. Now, the key thing, because, um, you know, this is a stochastics driven seminar, is what are the actual stochastics of uh, the system? Well, the stochastics will be that, uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is a system of scale with granularity. It will actually be unpredictable how these users are gonna arrive over time, whether a user with a certain feature vector, of a certain type, uh, how it's going to be arriving over time. Um, and we'll need to think about how to strap on some kind of uh, arrival process, some kind of model of, of, of randomness to actually describe uh, how this is happening. So what we're gonna do today is we're actually gonna be saying that a user of type I, so this guy here, um, will actually be arriving over time as a Poisson process with rate lambda i. Okay. And this is a similar model to uh, what we might see in airline revenue management and all sorts of uh, uh, revenue management applications. This type, of, this type of model is sort of a, a workhorse model um, in, uh, in, in RM. <laughs> So the question then will be, well, how do I actually pick this matching uh, to, to maximize revenues? Well, sorry. Um, let's think about an exact formulation of the problem first. <coughs> so let's make capital lambda i of t be the number of arrivals of user of type i uh, that happen up to time t. Okay, so we have a Poisson process, it governs these arrivals and we're just counting the arrivals, uh, the number of arrivals by time t. Okay. Um, and then what we need to think about is how we've matched, you know, who we've actually, which, which user we've actually matched to a certain advertiser. Okay. So let's think about any arbitrary policy that doesn't cheat. So any non-anticipatory policy. 
Um, and let's make capital Y I J uh, of T be the number of users of type I, which pi allocated to advertise at J up to time T. Okay. So up to time T, I'm actually observing this policy. Um, I'm counting how many times did this policy actually send something from type I over to an advertiser of type J. Okay. Well, <coughs> then I can think about an optimal value for the platform, which I'll denote by little v star. And this will be a maximization over all policies of what? So I'll maximize an expected value of uh, the over all different um, user and advertiser types of the reward that I get from matching across that specific edge in the bipartite graph um, times how much I've actually done that match. Okay, so times yij pi of t. Um, but then this will be subject to some constraints. So I'll have a capacity constraint that, that says basically, um, I should never try to send to an advertiser more than they've actually committed to spending, uh, committed to taking. Uh, via the contract. So this has to be less than or equal to CJ. And this is an almost sure constraint. And at the same time, I don't want to allocate more of a particular user type than I actually have available. Um, and this will be uh, another almost sure constraint here. So this is sort of a capacity constraint. This is a uh, supply constraint. Okay. Now, this at this stage um, looks similar, I would say, um, to a problem, for instance, like network revenue management. So in network revenue management, uh, you manage, uh, you, ma you, manage uh, uh, you know, how many uh, fair classes of a particular type are you going to, whether a fair class of a particular type will be um, accepted or rejected when a customer of that fair type comes in, um, well, there you actually have a very, very similar uh, optimization structure. Because there you're also going to be maximizing some kind of expected reward from the entire sequence of your accept, reject uh, decisions. And something that we were seeing there, I think in uh, module one, was that, um, there you also had some kind of capacity constraints. You had capacity constraints on the seats and they were almost sure constraints. And the presence of these almost sure constraints uh, were make, making the problem uh, quite difficult, okay? Nevertheless, you know, this is a valid problem. This is a problem that you could solve as a dynamic pro pro program. Uh, really the issue being that, you know, solving dynamic problems comes with, with sort of a, an instantaneous issue, which is the curse of, of dimensionality. Um, and certainly if you're talking about an application like this, you'll have plenty of dimensionality to, to, to run into um, as a challenge, okay? So this is kind of a thought process. It's a good way to think about um, the optimal value of the problem, uh, but not a particularly practical way of actually uh, solving the problem itself. Okay. <laughs> Any questions? Hi. Uh, yeah. So this may Hi, be super fundamental. I feel like I am missing something. Yeah. But um, perhaps I'm not under understanding the trade offs here very well. Uh, what, why isn't it optimal to always send? uh a user to the highest paying advertiser as long as they have capacity okay very very good so so here's what could go wrong with that okay um what could go wrong is imagine that okay um i should have probably prepared this uh this example uh before and not come up with it online but let's imagine that, you know, so you have this bipartite graph of users and you have the, on the other side, you have advertisers, okay? So um, perhaps what will happen 
is that a particular user will come in. So a time T1 early, basically, a user will come in and uh, you can send them to this advertiser for a price of 1.01 .01, and you can send them to this advertiser. Is this clear? 1.01 .01, and you can send them to this advertiser for a price of one. So one cent less, right? Um, so with your policy, you would say, okay, let me send them here. I send them to this advertiser. Here's what could happen. Um, maybe this other advertiser that's paying a little bit less, okay? Uh, they are only matchable with this particular um, instance type, this particular user type. But then there's a different user type. Uh, the other user type is one that the first advertiser, you know, doesn't really care. So I'll get matched to both, both different types of users, right? So now do you see what goes wrong? Basically, I kind of wish that I would have been less greedy. I send this one to this advertiser and I clear them out. And then this other one, let's say that this one is also a dollar. I send it to the other advertiser. I make $2 versus 1.01. Yeah, yeah. So basically, That's the difficulty totally comes no. from the fact that, uh, well, there's budgets and there's different compatibilities. Um, and a certain certain user, certain impression might be, uh, someone might be willing to pay more for it, um, but maybe someone, maybe it just has a has a better opportunity cost to actually be uh, sent somewhere else. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know if you, I don't know if you're in that module or. Um, whether you're aware of this, but again, kind of making the parallel to airline RM. Um, in airline RM, there's this concept of bid price controls. So, you know, if we think about bid, bid price controls here, there should be some kind of adjustment. So actually what you're thinking about is, okay, is a greedy policy good? Uh, for me, a bid price control is an adjustment of the greedy policy. So you kind of adjust the rewards by some kind of opportunity cost so that once you do that adjustment, you can do, you can just do things greedily, but once you've adjusted for the opportunity cost correctly. So um, actually that's something that, that we'll be able to do here. And, uh, and I'll show you what I mean by that in, in just a little bit, okay? But certainly very, very good that uh, this, this is cleared up, okay? So um, if this is something that we can't compute, so very, very good thought process um for how to how to think about opt but not something that we can actually compute well let's actually think about how to simplify this problem and i think a lot of what we do in revenue management is we start with a complex problem and we think about how to reframe it as a much simpler problem and then we basically just see well how much have we lost from from actually the simplification so here's one way to actually uh, simplify the problem. And this is something that's related to the concept of a deterministic LP. So this sort of optimization problem, I mean, it looks a little bit similar to an LP, except that it's not an LP. It's actually a stochastic problem because you have these almost short constraints. So what if we somehow made it uh, deterministic? And here's what we do to make it deterministic. Well, this guy here, this is a random variable. <coughs> well, why don't we make this random variable something deterministic in the deterministic LP? So how do we make it a random variable? Well, I may not know what lambda i at cap t is, but at least I know what its expectation is. So why don't I replace this stochastic thing with its uh, expectation counterpart? So I make this uh, little lambda i t, okay? Um, and just if I do this, then I can think about a deterministic LP where I'm just maximizing. Well, yij is sort of the total flow, um, average flow that I'm going to send across one of these edges. And I want to maximize the um, weighted value of this flow. So pij times yij, um, subject to the same sort of capacity constraint on this flow. Um, and subject to the supply constraint not be, now being a deterministic supply constraint. Okay, well, at least I've written down an LP. Um, and I can actually think about solving this LP. 
And if I write down what the objective value of this LP is, well, I'll call this VDLP. Um, and you'll immediately get a result that basically says um, this VDLP is an upper bound on the true opt. Okay. So at least I've written down a problem that I have some hope of solving. Um, I don't know how close I am. I don't know if it really represents the true optimum. Um, I know that at least it represents an upper bound on the true optimum. Okay. So let's actually try to see how close we get to the optimum to the to the to the true optimum. Um, and in other words, let's let's actually see if we can turn this into um, a meaningful uh, policy. Okay, because the DLP by itself, it's not clear that it actually gives us a policy. So let's do that. Well, this is the um, this is the fluid approximation that I was talking about. So how can we how can we leverage this fluid approximation technology to say something about uh, the problem here? It's similar to the network revenue management uh, discussion from module one. Well, let me try to build a control policy. So I'll call this pi fluid okay, that somehow leverages whatever I get from the deterministic uh, linear program. And how can I actually do this? Well, in the real system, I will sort of get a discrete impression a discrete user, and I'll need to think about which one of the advertisers I'm going to allocate it uh, to. So, how can I actually get? How can I actually use the Ys that I get from the deterministic linear program to actually say something about how I allocate this um, this uh, particular impression? Well, here's one way to do it. Essentially, the D, the the deterministic linear program, what it's going to do is out of all the stuff that I can actually allocate of a particular user type I, um, the DLP will actually break it up into different Ys. So Y, Y1, Y, Y2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So what if I actually try to use these Ys as percentages? So what the deterministic linear program is going to tell me, or the way that I'm gonna interpret it, is roughly what you should what you should want to do is you want to allocate you know 20 percent of this particular impression type to the first advertiser, 30 percent of this impression type to the second advertiser, so on and so forth. Okay? So then let's use these Ys to actually define these percentages. <coughs> so I'm going to take the, the product of the deterministic linear program, this YDLP, and I'm going to define a fraction, Fij, which is going to be exactly this percentage. Okay, And then what I can do is I can do a probabilistic allocation. Okay, As in when someone with this particular impression type comes in, okay, I can basically just toss a coin. And that coin is a coin with probabilities Fi1, Fi2, Fi, um, you know, N. And this is actually going to, uh, this, this is going to determine which advertiser this particular impression comes from. Okay, the important thing is that these fractions actually come from the deterministic linear program. Um, <coughs> and the other thing is because, well, this deterministic linear program is, is going to make some mistakes. Uh, because it's using, using some kind of approximation of, of the future. Um, well, this means that it's, it's going to make mistakes. So at some point, for instance, what might happen is that I toss this coin, it tells me I should allocate to a particular advertiser, but actually what happened in reality is that this advertiser ran out of capacity. Uh, and in that case, you know, I'm just gonna throw that away. Tough luck, okay? And then I can think about a random variable that just tells me, well, what are the revenues that are attained by this fluid policy, uh, pi fluid? Okay. And hopefully we will be close enough. Questions about the construction of this? Well, let's see then if we can, um, if we can salvage uh, something from, from 
this fluid technology that that we know uh, to analyze this problem here. Okay. Um, well, here's all we're going to be able to show. What we're going to be able to show is that if you actually compare the DLP upper bound and we compare it to the expected revenues that are garnered by the fluid problem, um, these expected revenues will be um, bounded by O of square root T. So basically, if you think about T as the thing that moves, so T kind of regulates how large the market is going to be. Um, the gap between the DLP and the fluid policy by itself is going to be square root of T. Uh, we'll prove this proposition. And then actually the result that we're really looking for is going to follow immediately. Okay, So it's going to follow immediately because the result will be that the true optimum will be uh, at most O square root of T from uh, the expected values of the fluid policy. Okay. In other words, if you think about the ratio, of the, perfor the performance, what percent uh, the fluid policy loses versus opt, um, it's gonna be bounded. You're gonna have a loss of at least, uh, of at most uh, one over O of square root T. So it's something that's going to vanish with T. Um, and the reason why this is simple, the reason why we can just immediately go from here to here is because of what? Well, it's because uh, when we construct this deterministic linear program, this deterministic linear program has to be an upper bound on the true opt, okay? So um, V of DLP has to be greater than V star. So if I get a bound here, the bound here has to be at least as good. Okay. So that's what we're trying to do. Okay. Well, let's actually prove uh, this proposition here. The proof will be in two stages. So, Step one will be kind of something that's inconvenient about the way that this fluid policy will work is that, like I said, it will make some mistakes. So at some point it's going to try to allocate something and the advertiser isn't gonna have the capacity to do that, okay? So let's just not worry about that. Let's just assume that all of these advertisers had infinite capacities. So basically you just try to allocate, you're gonna be able to allocate, okay? This could be wildly optimistic, but I mean, let's start some. Um, <coughs> well, in that case, how much money is this fluid policy going to make? Well, it's going to keep allocating at these fractions, okay? And in expectation, so it's going to be randomized. It's going to be randomizing with these fractions. So in expectation, you're going to get exactly those fractions. So you're going to get. Um, well, Pij times lambda it times Fij, which is exactly equal to the revenues of the deterministic linear program. Okay, so an expectation, if I don't have any capacities, I'm just going to make as much money as the deterministic linear program. Okay, which automatically is telling me, you know, in reality, I can't possibly make this much. So, you know, I have gone too far by making this infinite capacity assumption, but maybe I haven't gone too far. So uh, that's the piece that I need to uh, worry about now. Florin, just a quick question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, so we're, <clears throat> we're getting a result that is a uh, fluid result as T goes large. Like, are the capacities linked to this T? Um, um, right. So, I mean, the question would be, so, I, I so, these, these, so these statements, I've actually made them without a fluid scale. Okay. So these statements are for whatever T is and whatever the capacity is, okay? But then if I wanted to make this go away, the way that I would make this go away is I would scale both capacities and T by the same rate. And then, you know, I would get sort of the, uh, the, the, the exact scaling. So basically, if I wanted to make this look like uh, one minus uh, O of square root K, basically the way that I would do it is I would make T 
into t times k, and I would make the capacities into t times k. So in, in it's that would just be the standard fluid way of, of expressing it. But but these but these O of Ts, they are correct as they are. It's just a question now, now that I know that the bound is O of T, um, what's what's the right scaling under which this bound kind of washes out and goes to zero? Um, okay, so step one is infinite capacities. Now, what do we need to worry about? Well, this fluid policy might be doing some over allocation. So let's just say um, that what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna start, I've over counted the revenues in step one. Let me start taking away all the over allocations to kind of balance out, to bring myself to a, to a true value of the optimal, of the, of the fluid policy. And to actually guarantee that I've, I've sort of penalized enough, let me, actually, let me actually just have a P max, which is the largest out of all the possible rewards that I can make. And for every time that I over allocate, let me actually penalize myself by P max. So the largest that I could possibly uh, have made if I was actually able to allocate that item, okay? Does that make sense? Um, so then how much will this policy over allocate? By how much will it uh, over allocate? Well, essentially what we need to count is the number of times that the fluid policy allocated a user to J. So, so let's think about advertiser J, okay? This policy pi f starts allocating to advertiser j. Um, how much has it actually allocated? Well, it's the number of times the fluid policy allocated minus cj and the positive part. And this is something that we would like to bound. This is something that we would like to be able to control somehow. So let's count this. So expected value of the number of over allocations. Um, and what I can do, I can take this number and actually break it down into a sum where I look at the, all of the over allocations that are coming into advertiser J, are they coming from type I user, type uh, you know, I prime user, so on and so forth. So I have a sum over uh, the number of times that I allocated type I to type J. Okay, and let's call this HIJT. Well, <laughs> then this is less than or equal to um, sum of HIJT minus this guy here. Okay. And now why is it minus this guy here? Well, it's minus this guy here uh, because if I think about the deterministic linear program, what the deterministic linear program makes sure is that the sum of yij dlp is less than or equal to cj. And this is equal to the sum of lambda it fij. So what this means is that just by the feasibility of the deterministic linear program that I, that I use to construct these fractions, um, this guy here is going to be less than or equal to cj. And then you know it's, it's clear why that inequality holds. Um, and then to go from here to here, this is just a standard. Uh, this is just a standard bound. This type of uh, this type of uh, uh, of, of uh, plus value expectation. It can be bounded by variance. And the important thing here is that at the end of the day, you're going to get some stuff that you can think about as constant in the problem instance times something that scales with with time with cap T, with the thing that will vary, um, and in particular with the square root of cap T. Okay. So what is this saying intuitively? What this is saying intuitively is that if I actually count the number of over allocations, well, by how much do I need to worry of, uh, how, how big can these over allocations uh, be? Well, I have like T of these opportunities. I, at most, square root of t will actually be uh, sort of missed ones because I've actually uh, uh, tried to over allocate 
uh, to an advertiser. Good. So <coughs> then if we actually combine these two steps. So what do we know? Well, the expected value of the fluid policy, um, and these are the wrong signs. Um, so these should all be greater or equal to. Um, what do I have? Well, I, step, I start with a lot of revenue from fee DLP. So that's step one. Okay. But what I need to do is I need to subtract a bunch of revenues from the overcounting. I'm subtracting them at this rate of P max, highest possible rate. And then what I have here is now I'm just summing up over all the different advertisers, how much I could have overcounted in each advertiser. And um, this is the bound from step two. And I will get um, something that, uh, that loses at most O of square root T. Okay. And that's the result. Any questions? So uh, what have we done so far? Um, I think it's actually a, a very useful exercise um, to kind of bridge everything in this course, to actually go back and compare what we've done here to the network revenue management problem from module one. And for the network revenue management problem, uh, there was actually a, a relatively similar type of argument that showed you why in that problem you could construct some kind of deterministic counterpart to that problem, use it to create a fluid policy and then show that the fluid policy under an appropriate scaling uh, will uh, actually perform quite well. So what we've done here and what I wanted to show you here at least so far um, is that basically the workhorse technology that one has in revenue management, it's a workhorse technology that you can apply here too. What we've done is we sort of reconstructed um, a fluid analysis, but we've actually reconstructed it for this kind of problem here. Okay. Um, a couple more uh, things to note about this. Uh, this is maybe related a little bit to Ron's question. So something that people do, um, and for various reasons, this is actually the sort of policy that's much more likely to be um, used in a, in a practical revenue management system in online advertising is instead of doing, of constructing the policy in terms of these fractional allocations, uh, the way that people do it is they start with the deterministic LP as we saw it before. Uh, but then they actually look at the dual of this deterministic LP. And from this dual of this deterministic LP, you can actually construct um, a shadow price, a dual variable, uh, mu j, for the budget for the capacity constraint of each one of these advertisers. Okay. So now, why is that important? Because sort of in the example that I gave uh, that I gave Ron, now what mattered is that each one of those advertisers had a different opportunity cost of the specific capacity that they were actually uh, using. And this is a way to assign an op a true opportunity cost to that specific capacity. And it actually allows you to construct a different control policy, which is a bid price control policy. So what does this bid price control policy say? Well, a particular user of type I arrives. Okay, so a user of type I arrives here. Um, and then I need to think, do I send them to this guy, this guy, this guy? Well, all that I need to do is I need to look at the uh, instantaneous revenue that I'm gonna make from this allocation, but I need to discount it by the opportunity cost of the capacity that I'm gonna use for each one of those advertisers, okay? So I adjust um, all the rewards by their correct opportunity cost, and then I just pick um, the best reward pol uh, possible in this adjusted space. And you can basically sort of run through a very, very similar argument to this. And you can show that if you construct a bid price control policy like this, it will enjoy basically the same kind of O square root T uh, scaling bounds um, as the previous policy. Okay. And 
for various reasons, this is actually something that people are much more likely to use um, in, 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 in the real world um, because it's, it's a much, much more interpretable control. And once you actually think about the policy in the space, there's all sorts of shortcuts that you can take computationally such that maybe you don't have to solve the entire deterministic LP. Maybe you can just do a little bit of sampling or you know, various, various different tricks um, and still get a good policy. Okay? Because I should also say, you know, if the DP is, is hopeless to solve here, actually at online advertising scale, uh, even this deterministic linear program might be something that's quite, uh, quite challenging to solve and you know, that you need to think about uh, quite a lot. So that was the first piece. So contract-based advertising. Um, here's a stochastic problem that looks a little bit like network revenue management. And what we did is we took uh, fluid analysis. We took it as a, as a universal technology and we used it uh, for this problem as well uh, to get bounds. Some interesting research directions here uh, that I uh, thought about mentioning. Um, so, Whatever you might have seen previously, in terms of whether you can actually reduce the error from uh, O square root of t to something to something small. Um, basically, any kind of technology that will work for the network revenue management problem uh, to actually accomplish this, uh, you can probably take it here. So a couple of relevant papers. Um, you can do this via just re-optimizing the deterministic linear program. Um, there are some like very, very interesting new papers uh, on um, basically like kind of um, uh, compensated uh, coupling and uh, something called the base selector, uh, which also allows you to get uh, much, much better bounds. Uh, but basically, this is a way to sort of construct something that's a bit more, uh, that's better than the fluid model, but in some sense, it's still the same underlying technology as the fluid approximation. Um, there's research where people are looking at how do you solve these contract problems, uh, but in situations where the platform, when it actually has to fulfill these contracts, it can also actually go to an ad exchange, and instead of using a user to fill up a contract, it can just go and try to sell something in an ad exchange, um, and, and there's a paper that I put here, um, and then something that's I think very, very interesting and sort of on the boundary of, of, of new research is, so we've looked at this from the perspective of revenue management. So how do you maximize the platform's profits? But then, like I said, these systems are interesting because they're also dynamic and they're endogenous. So for instance, the users of the system, the advertiser, uh, the advertisers might also have a mind of their own and they might have a certain level of happiness with how the campaign was fulfilled, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's why it's actually quite interesting and quite relevant to think about optimizing other metrics. So you might wanna solve this problem where the, the, the objective is not necessarily platform revenues. Uh, for instance, it's just quality to the advertisers, some kind of social welfare of the system. Uh, you can think about solving this problem with an objective where you're thinking about uh, fairness to advertisers. So there's a fixed piece of pie of all the different users impressions that you can allocate. Um, and you need to allocate this fixed piece of pie to all sorts of different advertisers. That means that there's gonna be some inequity, there's gonna be some inequality in you know, how much utility, how much surplus each one of the advertisers gets. And in that type of situation, you might want to think about, well, can I actually get some kind of fairness bounds? Can I say something about you know, how equally I'm treating the advertiser? Something about equity. Um, and there's, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, recent work um, there as well. Okay. And that's the first question. So that was the first question that uh, we've tackled. Now, before I move to a different system, a different type of uh, question that you could that you could you could ask here, um, any questions that I can answer about this? Sorry. Right. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Ron. Yeah, relating to to uh, your comment about uh, uh, endogenizing the yeah. uh, the behavior of the advertisers. So if you imagine these advertisers as like price, price setters, uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you kind of game the this uh, this behavior. Uh, would assuming all, all advertisers are assuming that you use that policy you you introduced. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that this kind of policy incentivizes the advertiser to overprice or underprice? Or can you say something about that? So, so you're sort of thinking about a meta game where I'm describing. Uh, I, I have like I have advertising budget. I need to set yeah. prices. I get something from. Uh, so where did this contrast come from? Like what <laughs> the prices come from, et cetera, right? That's that's right. what we're talking about, broadly speaking. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's that's a very very good question. Um, I wouldn't say that there's a lot of work on that. Um, most of the work that I know kind of takes these prices as given, and there's not a very strong there's there's not a lot of a very clear understanding of what happens in in the meta game. Like, uh, you know, when you run this for a very, very long time, what does it actually mean in terms of uh, how advertisers set prices, et cetera? I think one way to fix this is to actually approach it as some kind of general equilibrium problem. Um, so ultimately, you know, it's a, think about it as an economy, people have budgets, and somehow these prices are an output of some kind of general equilibrium. There's some kind of market that describes these prices. Um, Actually, in I have a paper. So, in this paper here, um, we actually try to do something like uh, general equilibrium or some kind of equilibrium to 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 generate the prices. Uh, but there's no concept of a meta game. Basically, it's just a it's it's just a question. It's it's a concept of within this sort of micro level game that I described here. Um, how could you actually solve the the problem as a general equilibrium problem and actually output the prices along with the allocation from a user to, to an advertiser. So that's something that I know that would kind of answer your question. Um, but you know, not sure that I have a very, very good answer for you there. Um, either you know, empirically in terms of what tends to happen or what theory would suggest. But I mean, that would be a very, very interesting question, I think. And actually, yeah, very, very interesting question to, to think about. Do you mind repeating the question? I think I'm not sh quite sure what the question was. So the question would be like, imagine, you know, I described the game that happens from zero to T, right? But then there's mm -hmm. T to two T, there's uh, two T to three T. And in each one of these cycles, maybe, you know, all these contracts get renegotiated. Mm -hmm. right? So one of, this con one of these contracts lives from zero to T, it ends there, and then you renegotiate to enter a new contract to the platform for the next cycle and the next cycle and the next cycle. So Ron's question was about, you know, what's the behavior that emerges out of that? Uh, whatever happened in terms of prices in the first cycle, does it actually have a consequence for prices in the second cycle and so on and so forth? Yeah. I see. So what's the long-term behavior of, of the system? Okay. Hmm. All right. Now, in the time that I have remaining, I want to uh, go a little bit uh, faster and get to the second question. Um, and the second question was, well, what if we actually look at a different model? And this is actually the model that's prevailing nowadays. So if you're looking at where this market is going, it's less and less about contracts. It's much more about actually trading impressions, trading users on these things called ad exchanges. So how does an ad exchange go? Work. Um, well, you have a publisher that might be the New York Times. Uh, it gets a flow of users that just go to the website. Um, but now there's no advertisers that have some kind of contract with the platform. What happens is that um, the publisher will submit one of these users. It will actually submit it to an ad exchange. And the ad exchange will then run an auction uh, among all the different advertisers that are interested in this particular user, uh, the auction will be either second price or first price, and the auction will actually determine uh, who gets this item and at what price. Okay. So broadly speaking, what we're changing here, no more contracts, everything gets traded um, through an auction. Okay. And obviously now, if we're talking about auctions, we'll, we're going to need to think about equilibrium, uh, strategic behavior, et cetera, et cetera. 
So to put a little bit of a little bit more meat on this, so what would happen in, in this picture? Well, let's say that we have a single arriving user. And now this arriving user will be will get sent by the ad exchange. It will get set, sent to a set of advertisers. Um, each one of these advertisers, first of all, they will have some dollar budget for how much they're willing to spend from for you know, some period of time. So let's say that their campaign will go from zero uh, to cap T. And over this entire uh, period, they'll have a budget BJ of dollars to spend on ads and on bidding. So um, with this budget, they will submit a bid. So let's say the advertiser J will submit a bid BIJ for this guy here. Um, and what the platform will do is it will just run a second price auction. So it will rank all the bids in order. So let's say that the bid of this advertiser J indeed was the highest bid. And then J will win this particular, uh, uh, this particular user, but it will win it at the second highest bid, okay? So you win the impression, but uh, your, your payment is actually determined by the second price. Uh, second highest bid. So the question that I want to shift now, it's not a central level question, not about what the platform should do, but rather of what one of these advertisers that participates in the exchange, how they should work. Okay. And in particular, one of these advertisers, how should they, what kind of bidding strategy should they actually use in the exchange? Okay. So why is this problem interesting? Why is it hard? Well, if you think about, um, if you think about a timeline of this user living in the system, okay? so this user will start with a budget B. Okay? And if it was actually a single user, um, a single impression that this user actually bid on, uh, over this entire time period, what do you think their optimal bid might be? What do you think their optimal strategy might be? So let's say that we, let's say, you know, we're dealing with a market, there's a single impression that this user is ever gonna see throughout their entire life, okay? Single impression that they bid on. It's a second price auction. How much should they bid? Bid with their true value of that user? Yeah. So if this was us, so in a second price auction, what we know is that we have an answer for the optimal strategy. If it's just a plain vanilla second price auction, um, this, this, this problem is going to be easy. The advertiser just bids their true value. Everything's done. Everything's good. Everything's fine. Obviously, that's not the answer here because it would not be an interesting question though. Um, so let's actually think about what is different about the setup, setup here because the mechanism is still second price. What is different uh, that makes it such that it's no longer optimal to just bid your true for valuation or it may not necessarily be optimal to bid your true for valuation, your true valuation. Well, this comes from two things. So first of all, as one of these users, uh, will live in the system, there's not going to be a single item that they're going to bid on. So they actually need to think about multiple bidding opportunities because multiple users will actually arrive at the ad exchange and get auctioned off by the ad exchange and they'll be able to potentially bid on all these different users um, and win those users. Okay. So let's say that you know the user's arrivals, uh, there's an impression that arrives with Poisson rate um, ADA. And every time one of these impressions arrives, um, there's some distribution from which uh, the user is actually going to get their valuation for this particular impression. Okay, so now I basically get a stream of impressions with a stream of, of different valuations from for them, and I need to think about how much I bid for each one of these different impressions, and how many of them. You know, I could think about hundreds of thousands, millions over the course of the day. 
The other thing that's actually difficult is that I'm actually going to have a budget. Okay. So what could happen if I'm super, super aggressive and I try to bid uh, for all the impressions here and I try to bid truthfully? At a certain point, my, what might happen is that here I run out of budget. And I will lose the opportunity to actually bid on the future impression. Okay. So basically, I'm going to deal with budgets. I'm going to deal with opportunities that come over time. And in this kind of situation, maybe it's no longer clear that I want to be truthful in how I bid. All sorts of new strategies might happen. Maybe I want to be a little bit conservative. I want to bid less uh, so that I don't exhaust my budget too fast. Who knows? Okay. Um, uh, Florin, just a quick one. Maybe I missed yeah. it. But uh, if they have a budget, do they have a cap? I mean, uh, do they have a capacity or uh, not? No, so no more capacity. So we What's switch from, okay. um, from a unit from a unit capacity way of thinking about things. So now these guys just have a budget. You know, for today they have a budget of five thousand bucks. So what's their objective? Their objective is to uh, use this budget with as much ROI as possible. So I'm going to buy a bunch of these guys with, I'm going to buy this guy, this guy, this guy with this budget, with these 5,000 bucks. And then I'm going to think about how much surplus I actually generated from actually acquiring these impressions. Right. right? So basically V minus how much I paid for them. And I'm going to try to maximize the surplus. Okay. But the tricky thing here is that we're actually dealing with a multi-unit auction and a multi-auction, a multi-unit auction with, with budgets. And, and that's what essentially makes this thing so uh, complicated. But, but uh, from, uh, I mean, yeah. again, uh, so from, a, from the point of view, the way you wrote it, it sounds like a, um, a reverse Gallego Verizon type thing where you have, you know, you have a, a kind of a reserve price, which will be the optimal one if you had just one or mm -hmm. kind of a reserve price that will make sure that fill up your, Okay. That's why I was asking you about capacity, right? Yeah, so okay. yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, in some sense, um, this is similar to all the problems that we saw before, mine and the ones from previous, uh, because really this becomes your new resource. So this is still is still some kind of resource allocation problem, except that the resource is this budget. Right. And I kind of need to think about you know what's the appropriate opportunity cost when I spend a dollar of this budget. Okay, I mean, that's what it is really, except that you strap on a bunch of game theory and a bunch of, you know, the analysis is seriously, seriously more complicated. And actually nailing down the problem in such a way that you can think cleanly about, a, a, about it as just a resource allocation problem, I mean, that's, that's quite complicated. But you have the right intuition that, so that's what you'd wanna do, okay? Um, and, you know, just in a, as an aside, uh, the classical way of actually solving a problem like this, so the question of how the advertiser should bid over time for all these units, um, it's basically a hopeless problem. Because if we try to apply some kind of you know, standard game theory to this, um, to answer, well, how much should I bid when I have a valuation VN at time TN for one of these uh, new arriving users? Um, well, at the minimum, what I would need to do as an advertiser, is I would need to maintain a history of all the different auctions that happened uh, before with how everyone else played in the auctions without, with how their budgets got depleted, et cetera, et cetera. And I would also need to hold some kind of belief about the future market dynamics because I need to compute expectations. And then I would need to keep track of, you know, when are people gonna run out of budget? How are they gonna bid in the future? So on and so forth, okay? So bottom line, you know, this is not really the right way to think about the problem. Uh, hopeless to get any kind of tractability thinking, thinking about the problem like this. Also potentially, you know, if you imagine that an advertiser in a system like this out of 10,000 different advertisers actually done th does this. So kind of keeps track of all the other advertisers, forms beliefs about how they're gonna play. Uh, you know, potentially you're placing an exceeding amount of rational expectations on uh, each one of these agents. Okay. And, the interesting thing, the, the, the framework to think about this, it's um, in this paper, and I'll, I'll put in a full literature if you um, at the end of the course so that uh, you can reference all of these things. But what this paper did is it came up with a very, very neat way of thinking about the problem with just the right amount of simplification to be able to get some 
uh, traction on this. Okay. So what's the simplification that we're going to use? So we're going to need, we're going to strap on a fluid approximation. Okay? So we'll make the problem fluid just like we did uh, with the previous example. But on top of this, we're also going to strap on a mean field approximation. So what does the mean field approximation actually mean? Um, well, if the difficulty in uh, computing your optimal best response is to keep track of what all your competition, all the thousands of advertisers in the system are doing, okay, let me actually simplify that and actually think about it as when I think about how much to bid, I kind of abstract away all of the com competition as, as you know, individual agents. I'm just thinking about competing against a steady state maximum bid that represents the entire competition, okay? So let's actually imagine that the competition will have a distribution. They all submit bids, there's a maximum bid, and the distribution of that maximum bid is actually stationary. It doesn't, uh, it's uncorrelated across time. It's, uh, and each one of these advertisers is sort of atomic and infinitesimal so that they don't actually change this, this distribution. Okay, and it's a reasonable, reasonable assumption to me. By the way, it's also inspired in practice. When you're an advertiser, Google will sort of show you a bid landscape. That's from historical data, how likely is it that you're gonna be able to win uh, at a particular bid level? Okay, so why is this the right way uh, to actually think about the problem? Well, what are we doing here? So forget about all the different advertisers in the system. Let's just think about them as a single block, the competition. And the single block produces a single bid, D, that has some distribution, okay? And then um, I get a new user. My own valuation for this user is going to be some random variable, D, okay? So that's gonna be the mean field approximation. On top of this, I'm gonna uh, put in a fluid approximation where I'm actually gonna assume that the advertiser budget constraints does not hold almost surely. Let me also say, I'm gonna bid on lots and lots of impressions over a day. Let, you, let me just enforce that that 5,000 only holds an expectation. So an expectation, how much I spend shouldn't be more than uh, 5,000. Okay, well, let's, let's write down an optimization problem that tells us uh, what the best response of this advertiser should be. So this optimization problem is what? We're looking for a bidding strategy that maps a valuation V into WF of V. And what we're trying to optimize is, eta is the rate of the process. So just think about that as the number of opportunities. So the number of time periods really. Um, and we're actually gonna assume that it's one, just so that we don't need to carry over another factor. And then what's in the objective of this optimization problem? Well, it's still a second price auction. I need to win against this distribution. If I win, what do I get? I get a surplus. So it costs me D to buy this uh, impression. I get a valuation V, so V minus D. Subject to what? Um, well, my spend, so if I win, I'm gonna spend D dollars out of my budget. It should be less than or equal to my budget. And this should be capital D. Okay. Make sense? But by the way, think about the best response of the advertiser without the fluid assumption. So I don't have expectation the constraint and thinking about you know, the behavior of all the different advertisers. What I've done is I've removed all of that and I've written everything down as just this one uh, relatively simple problem. And now it actually looks like a resource allocation problem. Like this constraint, you can think about it as your resource constraint and uh, it looks a little bit more like a resource allocation problem. And how are we gonna solve it? Well, we're gonna solve it exactly like a resource allocation problem. So let's say that there's a dual variable on this budget constraint. And then let's Lagrangeify the problem. So let's not worry, you know, we're not gonna get into the, the formality of, you know, why is this valid? Why is the Lagrangian, you know, are there duality gaps, whatever. Let's just assume that that works. So if I Lagrangeify the problem, 
what I'm going to be maximizing is this guy here. So mu b from the budget constraint. And also what I get is instead of v minus d, I get v minus one plus mu times d. Okay. <laughs> and let me actually rewrite this as um, maximizing a v tilde where um, v tilde is basically just my best response strategy, except that as an input, instead of uh, taking in w, it takes in w over one plus mu, okay? So now what does this look like? Well, now this actually looks like a second price option I have no constraints because I've Lagrangified the problem. So it's a single item second price auction. So that's simple. And we know that for a second, a sec second price auction single item, no budgets, the optimal strategy is to bid true. Okay. So in this second price auction, I have a V tilde of V plus over one plus mu. So the interpretation is this is a second price auction in which my valuation is not V, but V over one plus mu. And in the second price auction, actually, the correct strategy is to bid truth. So I bid V over one plus mu. So V tilde is V over one plus mu, and that's equal to uh, W of V. So basically, the optimal strategy is to just use this value here, and I can go and plug it in uh, back into the problem. Okay. Any questions about this? Does this make sense? Um, and by the way, so um, like the fluid policy, I'm I'm over allocating and running out of time. How much how much more time can you can you give me to wrap things up, Victor? Uh, five minutes is good. Okay, so let me try to wrap this up in in five minutes. Okay, so what does this say? So we started out with this. Don't problem. get penalized. So that's <laughs> well, we'll we'll Lagrangify it. Um, and what the, Lagra what the Lagrangify problem is, is something that you can solve. And it tells you actually what you should bid is V of W equals V over one plus mu. Okay. So what does this mean? Um, well, this leads to a proposition that says, if I go and I try to minimize, the bidder can just go and minimize this. Um, this Lagrangified problem and gets a shadow price mu star. So this is a shadow price mu star that's sort of the correct opportunity cost of a dollar of a dollar of budget that you can spend. Okay. So then what is an optimal bidding strategy for this advertiser? Well, just report your true valuation, but then shade it down by your opportunity cost of the budget. So that's why you should bid in the auction. Not a truthful valuation, just a shadow value, a, 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 a shaded valuation where you bid a little bit less depending on whatever your true cost of budget is. So if you have high budget, you're just gonna discount your true valuation by more. If you don't have a high budget, sorry, if you don't have a high uh, dual on your budget, then you're not gonna shade at all, okay? And you can even think about a Sandy chart. So what if B is actually infinite? So what if all the budgets were infinite? Well, if all the budgets mu were- Mu star infinite, equals zero. Yeah, so mu star equals zero. So you're actually bidding your true valuation, right? Is that intuitive? Well, intuitively, if your budgets are infinite, kind of all of these auctions decouple because you don't have to worry about you know, the correlation that you get through, through the budgets. And if all these auctions decouple, they're all decoupled, simple vanilla second price auctions, you just bid true for, okay? So- But so this can, shading policy, like when everybody's applying it is in equilibrium? So that's the question, right? Because we strapped down two levels of approximation. So one level of approximation was the fluid approximation. So we're looking at expected spends. The other level of approximation is that 
Well, we actually imagined that we're just competing with this, the, like this big blob distribution, which is some kind of mean field distribution that approximates you know, the individual behavior of everyone. So what could go wrong now? Well, this particular, this particular new star here, so the strategy, will depend on whatever mean field distribution I start off with, right? So what I need to make sure is that there's some kind of consistency. What I need to make sure is that now, if I actually think about, um, there's some kind of distribution of all the advertisers in the system. And now if I look at one of these advertisers in the system, okay, they use a bidding strategy. So they decide how much to bid. And it could be, it could be given by, this, by, this, uh, by the shadow price mean. And that's actually going to induce a, 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 a mean field distribution. It's going to induce a particular distribution of D. So for this to actually be a proper equilibrium, what do I need? I need the other loop in the system, which is that if I go from a bidding strategy into a D that it induces, and then I sort of try to invert this, if I start with that D and I invert, it needs to actually lead me back to the best, to the same uh, best response. Okay, um, and it actually turns out that you can do this. So you can show via, you know, Kakutani fixed point theorems, you know, uh, things that are more game theoretic. So we won't get into them now, um, but you can actually show that there is a fluid, uh, a fluid mean field equilibrium. So basically, you're making this assumption, but the assumption you can sort of verify that this assumption is valid. If everyone plays this, you will get um, a mean field distribution. Does that sort of answer the question? Exactly. Yeah. And then there's another layer of approximation, um, which is also the fluid assumption. So the fluid assumption says that uh, I only care about my budget, my spent in expectation. Uh, there could be more things that go wrong if budgets don't actually hold an expectation, but need to hold almost sure. Okay. So then you actually need to do a fluid analysis on top of this mean field and actually show that if you're an advertiser and your budget constraint um, is, doesn't hold an expectation, it holds almost surely. And everyone else actually plays this fluid mean field strategy. Then if I actually have an almost sure constraint, I don't lose too much. Okay. So if I try to best respond to that, there isn't really a best response that's going to make me much more money than if I was just sort of following this fluid mean field strategy, assuming that's kind of built on in expectation uh, budget constraints. And that technique, I mean, it's something that's it's it's more sophisticated than what we what we saw in the first example, but at the core, it's the same thing. It's uh, thinking about the fluid problem and just making sure that in an appropriate scaling of the problem, um, you don't really lose much when you swap out an almost sure constraint with an expectation constraint. You mean the square root error remains? In that yeah, side. yeah. So, so you'll get some kind of square root error, but uh, the sort of scaling and the sort of argument is actually much, much more uh, delicate here. And I, I won't get into it now because I uh, won't have the time to do it. Okay. All right. Um, I let you conclude, Flor. So um, a couple of different interesting other research questions. So there's this, there's this issue of how much you, how you bid on the advertiser side. Uh, there's also all sorts of uh, interesting research questions if you still think about auctions, but you think about uh, sort of decisions at the centralized level, decisions at the platform stage. So for instance, you can think about how to add a reserve price to the second price auction. So in this sort of situation, the only lever that the platform has left is how to optimize the reserve price to get more revenues. So uh, you can sort of apply the same kind of bag of bag of tricks and technologies to actually think about uh, reserve price optimization. Um, there's all sorts of other things that platforms do um, to either increase revenues or get more balanced uh, budget consumption. And I have a couple of papers here as well. Um, there's a side to learning 
which is how do you even learn what the right valuation is um, as you play in the system? And, and that's another research direction with a couple of papers. Um, and also back maybe related to, to Ron's question at some point, uh, there's all of this meta game as well, where at a very, very long, in a very, very long picture, how does the market uh, change and what are the dynamics of the market? And, uh, and that in itself is, is interesting as well. Okay. So um, I'll stop here because it sounds like I've run out of time. Uh, <laughs> and we'll- Counting. <laughs> I, will, I, will not, I, will not, I will not abuse your goodwill uh, further. Um, but uh, of course, I'll stick around if there's if there's any kind of uh, any kind of questions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll meet you uh, the next session. Uh, but if you have questions, uh, uh, Florin is uh, is around. But I want to make sure everyone can you know can uh, can leave if you have to. Right. Have have a good one and see you soon. Any question? Actually, I have a question. You have can, can you hear me? Okay. I yeah, I emailed you, Florin, but since there's time to ask questions, um oh. I was curious. Um it's been a while since I read classical auction papers, mm -hmm. but I seem to vaguely recall that if you have multiple units that you auction off over time to a set of bidders that each have unit demand. Mm -hmm. Is my memory correct that you get a similar result? Of, of course, that setting is a lot simpler than what you have. But this notion of bid shading, you know, because you have repeated auctions that are linked over time, right? And, and, um, does that ring a bell or is, am I just hallucinating? Sure. I mean, well, I've seen this. I, I think that this bid shading concept was around before people looked yeah. at online advertising, but I, I'm not sure exactly which one you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a lot simpler that setup, right? Just to be clear, like I'm not saying how this, <laughs> I'm not saying this was all done before. I'm just saying that the flavor of the, yeah. Like you know the equilibrium structure, like you know the fact that you bid less than, mm -hmm. right? And th there seems to be some. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yes. Yeah. I mean that that uh, for sure has been around for for a while. Right, right. But I think in that literature, I'm also not sure. Is there a budget in? in no, no. I mean, it's a, it's like you can think of it as a again, like I'm. I mean. I'm not I mean, saying that this was done before. I'm saying I think yeah. that case could be almost viewed like as a degenerate version of your problem, where you know each each advertiser um, is just going to buy one unit, right? Or each right. bidder is just going to buy one unit, right. and because they're not bidding, because there's more than one unit. And the units are sold over time, and people would drop off once they got a unit, right? Yeah. yeah. It it biases what would otherwise be an equilibrium, right? But I think what's special here is that uh, the kind of bit shading that you do is very simple. Oh yeah, yeah. No, no. I, mean, I oh. think that the only way. So I I don't think that the econ like all like the you know econ people that did multi unit auctions. I don't think that any of them thought about the fluid side of things. No, 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 no. Like, right? let me I let me be clear. So I mean, I understand. No, no, no. I, <laughs> I understand. I'm just. I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that um, this is actually very clean. And yeah. It can only come through the fact that the fluid um, assumption kind of smooths things out. So the reason why you know you don't have something more like a more complicated strategy or it, it, look, this is a, in some sense this is kind of quasi truthful in some yeah. sense, right? Because yeah, yeah. you shade everything down by the same percentage. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and this is something that you could only get through the fluid. Uh, oh yeah, no, no, that would be totally hopeless if you consider so, the whole I mean, state of- You know, these, these, these are my two, two cents. I mean, um, yeah. this, this stuff comes from, I mean, this is uh, Santiago and, and uh, Omar, Omar and Gabriel's paper. So, I mean, well, we should ask Gabriel how he thinks about it uh, soon. But I think that, you know, what 
the ops people brought to this was was the fluid view of things. Like I think that was the key simplification, the, the insights. So. I mean, there's the paper. I mean, there was the work of uh, uh, Gustavo with uh, with Costis and uh, Garrett, right? Uh, mm. Yeah, but he sees this work basically, right? About right, right, right. auctioning uh, kind of a auctions and revenue management problem, and mm -hmm. to some extent, you need that kind of capacity problem to let this mu appear, right? I mean, in the case here, the mu's are for every budget, while mm -hmm. there the mu is going to be the opportunity cost of the remaining inventory, because, like you said, Philip, there will be unit demand, so there's no yeah. budget per se in your uh, yeah. Uh, but there should be some similarity there. But the problem yeah. is the complexity is that you have, you know, all these uh, you know, different budgets competing, right? Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Looking forward for the next session, actually. For it. Are, are there any questions, uh, other questions? I mean, I'll, I'd be happy to stick around if uh, everyone else has to go, but if there's something, happy to stick around. Yeah, it's earlier in Paris, that's why. No, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, no, no, feel free, uh, you mentioned. Oh, sorry. But uh, sorry, one you mentioned. Like, sir, feel free to make me co-host, and if you need to. Oh, no, 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 I was just kidding. Really. It's just one hour difference. <laughs> Go ahead, Ron. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier in that part of the talk that um, that exchanges are moving from second price to first price auctions. Uh, I guess that's, is, that's because of uh, considerations like profitability for the exchange manager. Um, it's unclear. I think the initial push for this um, was because people saw a first price auction as something that was more transparent for the advertisers. Um, and also the second price auction was, is sort of fundamentally flawed. So basically, why, why did uh, the initial people who designed these auction systems, they, why did they come up with this kind of second price system? They came up with it because they thought it was- Social Fee Creek? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, and they thought that it was truthful. I mean, there was this, this, this kind of intuition that a simple auction, uh, is going to be truthful. And it turned out that it was not, it was not so. Um, and I think then there's a push for a second, a, a first price auction is, is obviously a lot simpler to manage. Um, I would assume that on the side of an advertiser, it's also seen as less risk, as in, you know how much you're going to pay for something. Um, whereas in, you know, second price auction, also sometimes you know, you bid and actually your competition is very light. Like there's sort of very, very sparse. So I think a first price auction kind of makes it a lot clearer and easier maybe to forecast how much you're gonna be spending in these auctions. Um, but it actually turns out there's, there's a recent paper by uh, some of the co-authors who wrote this fluid mean field paper that, uh, that I'm talking about, that I talked about, that proves essentially a revenue equivalence. Uh, theorem. So, you know, when you're talking about kind of a simple auction, there's, there's revenue equivalence that basically says you're not going to make more money if you do first price versus second price. Um, it actually turns out that it extends to this, as in, you know, you have budgets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can get a rev revenue equivalence theorem that tells you if you switch from second price to first price, you're not going to make more money as the platform. I'm signing off. Thank you. See you on Monday. Take care. Have a good one. You Any other question? All right. Thank you. Thanks for again. The talk. Sorry. Right. Thanks.